which I'm, I'm living in and, and I'm standing on. So this is the acknowledgement of country that I'm going to deliver. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm standing on, the Nunavut people, and I would like to pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Later on, I'll tell you this statement that I have just delivered is also part of what the so-called public diplomacy. Why is that? I'm going to tell you later during the presentation. We can start the presentation now, but before the presentation, I want to clarify that this is not just about public diplomacy. This is more about political communication, various forms of political communication that Vietnam has employed over the past couple of decades. So uh, bear with me when I, uh, I uh, discuss point by point. So uh, I hope everyone has already seen the, the screen that I share, right? Yeah, sure. Uh... Sure, okay. So uh, let's begin. So in this, in this presentation, I will discuss three main points. And as briefly as I could, so that I could have more time for the Q&A part. The first part, the first point is a brief introduction into the contemporary understandings of public diplomacy. The second thing I wanna cover is the development of this concept and practice in Vietnam. And then the last part is just a brief discussion with a broader view into Vietnam and ASEAN, the commonalities between how Vietnam and um, ASEAN countries in conducting public diplomacy. Uh, without actually going really uh, into detail about the methodology of my research, because I believe we don't have much time for that. I would say that a lot, large part of my research get data from, empirical data from a lot of interviews and surveys that I have with political makers in Vietnam, as well as, quanti as, as, well as quantitative data from user queries and interactions on the web. It took me several years to collect such data for all the findings that I have in the book. What is public diplomacy? Or their very beloved nickname, PD, just like PA for public affairs. In the field, they, 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 they just abbreviated public diplomacy as PD. So what is public diplomacy? Or to be exact, why is there so much debate about public diplomacy? And just like Antum just asked some sort of a leading question there. What's the difference between all sorts of things that we hear when we talk about public diplomacy, uh, propaganda, external information management, cultural diplomacy, all sorts of concepts that are very close to public diplomacy. So the concept of public diplomacy is a PD is a 20th century product. However, the practice of influencing foreign publics could be traced back millennia. And in Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries, it has never been there. The practice of influencing foreign publics has never been strange to us. We can name like a few uh, practices, for example, propaganda, like psychological warfare. We have people's diplomacy, cultural exchange or international broadcasting. Those are all sort of practices that in a sense, in a sense previous versions of PD as we, underst as we understand it today. Uh, but the, but the, the, the term public diplomacy was first used in the US in the 1960s. And as easy as, as you can see, it is just public plus diplomacy, or the original understanding would be pub diplomacy towards the public, targeting the public. 
but it but has become it has been evolved into a very uh, popular field in international relations and in communication studies as well. So there has been a lot of debate and a lot, you know, uh, over the uh, the concept and the practice itself. So uh, when it comes to current understanding of public diplomacy, there are at least three scholarly approaches. From communication studies, PD is considered to be a tran transnational communication process exponentially empowered by uh, information and communication technology targeting the public. From the field of public relations and marketing, PD is image building for national, uh, for, for nations and for transactional organization. And the largest contribution, the largest field that has the uh, the field that has the, the strongest and the largest contribution to the study of PD is from politics and international relations. And in this field, PD is to is a tool to, to exert influence on a public for foreign policy objectives. And from now, and in this field, you also see a lot of things, a lot of other concepts that are linked to PD, for example, soft power or smart power. Having said that, despite all sort of diverse understandings of PD, nowadays, new understanding of PD, how, how, no matter how diverse, share at two, share two um, common points. The first is that PD is no longer, should no longer be just a one-way message, one-way messaging between, you know, from the government to the public. And the second point is that the public, and I put S in, you know, the public as a, as a plural form, because we are talking about not just international public, but also domestic public. And I'm gonna explain later on. So the public, are no longer just having uh, some sort of passive role as a target of a PD message, but now the publics can have different, more active roles. Why so? The, the main driving force be, be behind these realities is the thriving information and, 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 and communication technology or ICT. Because ICT breakthroughs bring about two enormous implications. There are fewer, much fewer boundaries between the domestic and the international because communication technologies have virtually flattened all the barriers. And the more digitally lit literate people are, the more interconnected and influential the public becomes. So, in the broadest of terms, modern, techno modern diplomacy is public diplomacy because there's nothing in diplomacy that is not public. You can check for it anywhere on the web, like a high level meeting between you know, leaders of two countries can be broadcast live on YouTube. So everyone has a chance to keep an eye on what used to be very clandestine, high-level, secret meetings. So in that sense, there's no kind of uh, concrete boundary between the international and the domestic anymore, which is why the public generally is not just international public, but also domestic public. The second implication uh, caused by ICT would be the overflow of information. The, the, the exponential production of information has caused some sort of serious shortened attention spans in a sense that you one, get, one can get too much information. They almost forget about what they just watched, just read right away. So the attention spans have become 
shortened dramatic, dramatically. And for that, a message, you know, a, a PD effort should not be just about messaging, not just about information, but also about trying to build certain bridge relationship with the public. Building relationship can have a lasting effect rather than just giving them information that they can soon forget. So overflowed information leads to short-term extension, which leads to the fact that we have to try to build trust relationship rather than just on sort of manipulations of information like propaganda. I can show you some, some stacks about uh, ICT penetration in Vietnam to prove how everything has changed when, with ICT. We have a population of about 98 million people as of 2021, 38% lived in urban area. We have 22 million internet users, which is about 73% of population. And we have about 76, 77 million social media accounts with about 7 million Facebook users and about 42 million YouTube users. And yeah, with that, with nearly 100, 100 million people, we have about 156 million mobile connections, which basically like two thirds more than the population. Which means the and Vietnam has always been on top of, of the country with the most uh, access to the internet. And the second one in Southeast Asia in terms of internet economy after uh, uh, after Indonesia and, 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 and I think Singapore. So the third in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, drawing on interviews and surveys with uh, stakeholders in Vietnam and mostly from uh, different sectors uh, and uh, under the, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, this is the, the, the definition for, for Vietnamese public diplomacy. First, public diplomacy, as understood by Vietnamese policymakers, is communicative, interactive efforts led by state actors towards the public to support various political, cultural, economic purposes including long-standing practices like people's diplomacy, external information management, and most notably, cultural diplomacy, involving diverse actors, all under the management of state actors. Why foreign public is the primary target Creating meaningful connections with domestic public is also increasingly important. And this is all the data that I got from, from various uh, interviews, long hours interviews and surveys with policymakers in Vietnam. So this is what they think. But this is not coming out of thin air though. Previously, Vietnam didn't have this kind of public diplomacy and I'm gonna tell you the next part about the evolution of Vietnam's public diplomacy or just the different versions, previous one and the current ones, current understandings of, of, of Vietnamese PD. So before Doi Moi in, in 1986, we are, Vietnam has this kind of public diplomacy that we also know as propaganda, mostly, I'm gonna, but it was a, 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 strategic, a strategic form, a PD that aimed to win the heart and minds of, 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 of target 
sorry, uh, uh, targeted foreign audiences. Now, the party state tailored messages, sent out delegations, and conduct various exchanges with its uh, with its international friends and foes. At the time, external propaganda and people's diplomacy played an important role in what is called the psychological warfare against the communist state's most powerful adversaries in the 20th century. And at the time, all of these public diplomacy instruments were designed for high impact and for immediate effect to support the military front. At the time, the door at the time, the domestic public was only secondary to the work of public diplomacy because they were under the purview of domestic propaganda. And with some sort of manipulative messages that foster a sense of nationalism and loyalty to communism. And these two themes usually were often considered to be inseparable because like we said patriotism means loving socialism so at the time there was there was no meaningful bridge between the international and the domestic publics except for the press which also was not exactly uh uh you know uh got a free voice in there so after the war uh, and you know, before the of the um, of the economic crisis in the 1980s, uh, Vietnamese foreign, you know, um, inspired by the political and, and economic reform, uh, ICTs, especially the internet, started to play a key role in Vietnam's global integration in the 1990s. And ICT has rapidly expanded the communication channels between Vietnam and the world. Along the way, online communication, online communities of Vietnamese at home and overseas have uh, expanded. And also international audiences are, also have easier access to Vietnam social life. Now Vietnam's PD has taken a turn towards inclusiveness and long-term visions. The contemporary intertwined publics, including the domestic Vietnam, the diaspora or Vietnamese overseas, and also international watchers, they all have more influence in shaping Vietnam's global image. So, now the, after the war, the oddity of, of the, the key objectives of Vietnam Vietnamese PD is no longer just to survive the war, but to develop for, for economic development and national security. We don't have to, the, the Vietnam doesn't have to, to divide friends and foes. Instead, we have, Vietnam has friends and partners. And Vietnam, even though propaganda is still there, a, a lot of other tools also were bringing to use, including cultural diplomacy and digital diplomacy and people's diplomacy with a different, with like a revamped version of, of people's diplomacy. And we, and Vietnam has involved more actors into, into PD work, including state actors, state sanctions actors, and non-state actors. And of course, the domestic domestic dimension of PD was there. It's not just for the international public, but also for domestic public as well. The next part about uh, the next part in my presentation is about one particular form of public diplomacy that is very that is that that is considered to be maybe the most famous and the most successful successful case for Vietnamese PD. It is called cultural diplomacy. And I think everybody knows about that. What I want to raise here in this part is not just 
is not to define or to name or to list certain activities under the banner of cultural diplomacy, but just want to draw a big, a bigger picture when it comes to, to the counter element in diplomacy. Because one could one could say when it comes to public diplomacy or when it comes to winning people, people's heart and might, there's no there's no more effective way than to go through cultural channels, which is why not just Vietnam, but a lot of other nations in Southeast Asia also use cultural diplomacy as the key instrument in public diplomacy strategies. The common denominator, the cultural element. You can see cultural diplomacy in Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, and the ASEAN Secretariat itself. So why so? Why is everybody interested in, and every nation interested in cultural diplomacy as the key tool for public diplomacy to reach out to other peoples and nations? First thing, cultural initiatives are more accessible and acceptable than political undertakings. And I'm telling this because I got a, a question about uh, about um, some sort of barriers when it comes to Vietnamese political system in reaching out to other countries. And, I'm, and this is the reason why culture is more accessible and acceptable than political undertakings because to be frank, the, the political values of many ASEAN members are not exactly compatible with the Western world. But culture, or cultures in this sense, you know, are things that always kind of fascinate people from outside of the region. So cultural initiatives are more accessible than political undertakings. That's the first reason. First reason. The second one is the economic benefits from, from cultural diplomacy. Uh, by a rough estimate, uh, regional countries attracted about uh, 135 million visitors intra and extra ASEAN after the implementation of various strategies of cultural diplomacy. The biggest beneficiaries being Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. So obviously, cultural diplomacy appears to yield high returns on investments. Uh, another reason why cultural diplomacy has become the, you know, the key example of public diplomacy in these countries, including Vietnam, is the fact that a lot of non-state actors, private organizations, private citizens can have a chance to contribute to, to, public, to public diplomacy, cultural public diplomacy, because when it comes to culture, it doesn't hurt. And when it comes to political endeavors, usually states can only trust state actors. So for this form of public diplomacy, a lot of actors can be involved. Um, I think that's 30 minutes up and I have covered uh, like, to be honest, just a small part of what I raised, what I discussed in the book, but I'm open up uh, the floor for the Q&A session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vu Lam, for a very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, I have read your book, and I have seen a lot of interesting points uh, in your book. Uh, you, you have covered national interest, and national identity, and ICT, and, and you consider those three components as the independent variables that have the impact on uh, Vietnam's public diplomacy. Uh, in this talk, uh, you, you, you do not mention much about that. 
and you do not mention about methodology. I think one of the strongest points in your book is about the methodology. You have very valuable data. You, you have collected from interviews and survey. You, you have interviewed uh, Vietnamese diplomats and, 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 and scholars that I don't think that our other Vietnam experts can have access to. Um, you also uh, collect, you also collected data from uh, some other social platforms from Google, Google Twins. And I, I think it's very, very uh, interesting in a way that uh, you want to back up your argument with uh, data. And it's different from uh, other, other works about uh, Vietnam uh, diplomacy that mainly focuses on, uh, the, the, on qualitative methods. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I think that we, we have uh, some uh, questions beforehand, those who, uh, who are very interested in the talk and they have uh, uh, sent uh, the questions to the organizers. Um, so I'm, I'm very honored to, uh, to represent them, um, to read a question to you. Uh, Dr. Lombo, sure. uh, uh, sure. uh, you, you want to uh, answer one by one or you want? Uh, yeah, one by answer? one would be good. Uh, one by one. one, by one. one. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, meanwhile, we are, we are waiting for the answers from Dr. Vu Lam and you, you can type your questions. They're in the tech box and we, we can collect your questions later. Uh, and now we are, um, I would like to read the first question from Gao Lê Wen An uh, from Học viện Ngoại giao and Lawrence University. Uh, she, uh, she is an undergraduate student and she has the question. Hiện tại Bộ Ngoại giao chưa chính thức sử dụng thuật ngữ ngoại giao công chúng trong chiến lược của mình à, mà theo như cháu biết wow, cháu sử dụng thuật ngữ khác là ngoại giao văn hóa diễn giả đánh giá như thế nào về cách Việt Nam đang thực hiện ngoại giao công chúng Việt Nam nhìn nhận như thế nào về vai trò của ngoại giao công chúng và ngoại giao công chúng cần đường lối thực hiện khác biệt như thế nào với các mũi nhọn ngoại giao khác ạ à? <cười> Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of a that's like a multi-part question there, and yeah. uh, I don't know whether I should address it in Vietnamese or or in English, but it's just like a little bit okay. Uh, but thank you for the question. Uh, just for accessibility, I'm going to answer the question in English. But I just want to preface by by telling something by answering uh, Dr. Tung directly about why I chose to to forego the part about methodology and the part about about the the the, in, the 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 three independent the three independent variables in my argument now the main argument of the book is actually about the three main the three key independent variables that dictate vietnam's foreign policy and not just foreign policy it says just uh let's say foreign policy just for 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 safety now, the three main invariable, uh, uh, sorry, uh, independent variables are national interest, national identity, and the development of of information and communication technology. And, and I and I argue that under the influence of these three main variables, Vietnam's for political communication, especially when it comes to public diplomacy has turned into a, sta a, a statecraft tomb that serves both inter foreign policy purposes as long as public affairs purposes. So in my argument, I would say basically the, the same thing about this, or to put it short, is just to say that public diplomacy in Vietnam is actually to be named correctly now. It is political communication, all sort of political communication, communication because all sort of thing actually face the public. So there's no escape from the public anyway. The reason I didn't mention the uh, national ident uh, national uh, the, the concepts of national identities and national interests are because to delve into that is to delve into a discussion about constructivism, social constructivism because you can only understand the concept 
of identity and interest, you know, under a constructivist lens. Vietnam's foreign policy for a long time has always been about applying realist for, for anyone in IR. A lot of what we do, a lot of uh, Vietnamese, you know, Vietnam scholars applied either a realist or a liberalist worldview on analyzing Vietnam's foreign policy. But, and according to those views, identity and interest are unchangeable. You never see things change when it comes to identities or interest, especially when it comes to a nation, which is to say, I am against that because we have multiple identities when it comes to multiple roles or types. And to understand that is just very simple. As a student, the identity of a student is because you are a student when it comes to your lecturer, because you are a student when there's a lecturer. So that's an identity. But when you go, when you come home, you are your dad's son. That is another identity. So, for example, it's just like some sort of very rough analogy about how identities can change. And together with that, interest can change as well. That's the basic argument when it comes from a constructivist worldview, when everything can change. In, in, and which is why I don't want to delve into that because there's going to be another discussion that might be half of my book in there. So just to say that Vietnam identities and interests have changed a lot the past couple of decades before the war, before Vietnam War, during Vietnam War, and after the Vietnam War. Everything has changed. Together with that, foreign policy changed. And you see that. You see the change in terms of foreign policy. You see the change in terms of domestic policy. But you think Vietnam's government's interests and identities never changed. That's going to be a big debate there. So I'm not going to delve into that. Uh, in terms of methodology, the reason I'm not talking about methodology is the fact that it actually um, a mixed methods between qualitative and quantitative data from, and I use a lot of the so-called uh, social media analysis, you know, coding and, 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 and tools just to draw data from, from Facebook or from, from YouTube. Explaining that would be out of the question because that's going to be a little bit hard. But just going to say that uh, I try to back up, just like uh, Dr. Chun said, I try to back up my arguments with all sort of data that I can have my hand on, could have my hand on. So uh, back to uh, the question uh, from, from, uh, from um, uh, Kunan. So yeah, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really a, um, a separate session right in the book about that, and I suggest you read it. Um, that discussed how uh, other concepts that have, frequent, that have frequently been used in Vietnam have some sort of strong relations, strong connections to the term public diplomacy. And I use data from my interviews and, 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 and in-depth key, uh, key stakeholder surveys with uh, policymakers in Vietnam to prove that all of the things like that, like you said, cultural diplomacy, propaganda, um, external information management, people's diplomacy, all of them are part of the now called public diplomacy or political communication. I would prefer that term as well. All of them has a lot to do with deliver a message to the public, trying to get some sort of response or try to influence the public in a sense that can help them deliver a, a positive, you know, um, 
uh, results in, when it comes to uh, you know, policy objectives. Let's say um, um, an example is like, uh, we have a lot of, um, previously we had a lot of videos on BBC and CNN to promote Vietnam's tourism. And we, we spent like about what, if I'm not mistaken, then it was about like about 200,000 uh, 200, uh, US dollars for one clip of about 30 seconds on those channels. What's the use of that to reach the publics in the UK and in the US? Why do you want to reach that? Why do you want to reach them? You want to introduce Vietnam to to those to 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 the, the, the UK and the US people. What else do you want from that? You want them to come visit, so that that is for economic development as well, tourist economy, tourism economy. But the point is also like this: those video clips you can also see even from Vietnam. So the clips are not just for the US and the UK, but people in Vietnam can watch that and they can commence too. Now, a lot of people said, how can you spend that much money on just like very kind of outdated videos? A lot of comments just like that. So basically, even the domestic, domestic public has, a, has some sort of say onto that, has some sort of ideas about what to contribute to the debate about a policy message. That is public diplomacy, or you can call it international broadcasting. You can call it people's diplomacy, if you will, or external propaganda. All in all, they are still public diplomacy because it involves the public for certain purposes, usually policy purposes. So the general idea among Vietnamese policymakers about public diplomacy is that they want this to be officialized. They want to have an official term. Right now, we don't have an official term. Sometimes people talk about that, but there's no legalized term for public diplomacy. And, like, and the problem with not having an official term is the fact that everyone would understand something differently. Simple as that. If you don't have an, an umbrella term, people would say, when it comes to public diplomacy, some would say, ha, huh, that's propaganda. Others would say, well, but I think it is cultural diplomacy without knowing that they are all part of public diplomacy. So the idea is just like that. And thank you for the question. I think the rest of that would be in the book as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vu Lam. Um, uh, we still have a lot of uh, questions in line waiting for uh, your answers. Uh, I think that I may combine some questions uh, okay. with similar contents uh, into one so that you can answer um, uh, easily. Uh, uh, the next question from Dang Chung Minh Sơn, a student from Korea University. Uh, he has the question like this. What do you think about Vietnam's identity uh, in terms of public diplomacy? Um, uh, another following question from uh, Bích Trần, uh, a friend of mine. She is currently a visiting fellow at uh, ISIS USAP ISAC Institute uh, based in Singapore. And her question is, uh, could you please name Vietnam's interests and identity without explaining their formations? Uh, so you can name uh, Vietnamese in, uh, national interests and identity and without talking about how they formulate those interests and, and, and identity. Uh, uh, please, uh, Dr. Lombo. Thank you for the questions. Um, so yeah, sure. Um, let me show you this. You know, this better this way rather than because this is one of the slides that I, uh, that I prepared, uh, but then I just um, hide it because I think we, can I just, I think I can share the screen, yeah just to show uh, my understanding about, uh, um, let me see if I can actually share. Okay, uh, 
about identity, right? Yeah. yeah. About this. Um, So uh, this is what I, sorry, uh, I don't know what, what is going on. Okay, so I'm not going to touch that anymore. So this is what I think about the evolution of Vietnam's national interest and identities applied to the work of public diplomacy as well. And to explain this is to actually, what I did was to, you know, I just, I can just go briefly into why I came up with this kind of list, uh, with this kind of uh, evolution uh, chart. I read the party's documents, the whole bunch of party documents since 19, 1930, especially the political reports. So what I did was to tabulate all sort of mentions when it comes to interest and identities. And I used a software to actually extract on terms coming you know, about you know, all mentions of the concept national interest and identities since the 1930s. The first political report by, uh, by the Communist Party of, at the time it was of Indochina, I think. So by tabulating all sort of all mentions of the two concepts, I see a pattern and the pattern is like, like this. Like for example, during wartime, our national interest was national security and international obligations for communist allies. The self-identity at the time was socialist, nationalist, but the collective identity, which means in a sense, Vietnam was considered to be part of the, community, uh, the communist bloc at the time. So Vietnam was considered, you know, the collective identity of Vietnam at the time were international socialism. And the primary means at the time in terms of foreign policy was military measurements, uh, measures and alliances. Now after Doi Moi, by the sheer mentions of those terms, in all political documents after Doi Moi, up until, uh, I did it until, two, sorry, I, um, 2000. With the mentions of those terms, the concepts around national interest and, and identities have changed. Right now, national interests are economic development and national securities. The self-identities, how Vietnam see itself, it is a sort of nationalist, customized socialist state. And when I say customized socialist, is, is the fact that this kind of socialist socialism right now we are having is completely different from the wartime socialism. And that's the truth, because it is not wartime anymore. Collective identities, right now, because we joined Vietnam has joined a lot of international organizations, including ASEAN. Vietnam actively engaged with all sorts of international platforms, but the most important when it comes to establishing a collective identity is regionalism. Or to be exact, ASEAN, regionalism, that is the collective identity. And right now, the primary means for foreign policy is no longer military measures. It is there, it is still there, but the primary one is diplomacy. Now, after I, after on, you know, uh, analyzing text about this, I also put these questions in my interviews and in my surveys with stakeholders. 
and they confirm this kind of understanding. Even that, you can see that even some high-ranking leaders the past couple of years actually mentioned this. Vietnam doesn't have fixed identities and doesn't have fixed interests. What we have is some sort of pragmatism. That's what they're saying. Some sort of flexibility. Or in terms of foreign policy, we use the term bamboo diplomacy. This is not a new term, though. The term bamboo diplomacy was, I think, first used by, 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 by Thailand. You know, some 40, 50 years ago, they coined this kind of term to, to say that their foreign policy is as flexible as the bamboos against the wind. Strong, yeah, they would just lean, the bamboo would just lean out towards the strong winds so that they would never break, something like that. And Vietnam, currently, we use this term a lot. And the concept is just like that. There's no fixed identities and there's no fixed interest. Or I'm going to put here a Vietnamese saying, đi về bụng mặc áo, cà xa đi về ma mặc áo giấy. That's what we do. Oh, just like that, be flexible and there's no thing, there's no fixate on anything as long as it serves Vietnam's interest. And the interest could be defined moment by moment, period by period. Now it is just economic development and national sovereignty, something like that. But it's not about survival. We don't need to survive anything anymore. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vũ, uh, because uh, sometimes I interchange your, your name. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. I just call you uh, informally Dr. Vũ. And uh, Vũ, uh, uh, I don't uh, want to take much of your time. I'm very curious when I see the term uh, customized socialism. Uh, uh, <laughs> can you elaborate on, the, on this term? Uh, customized in, in what sense? Uh, <laughs> so, is it customized like, now, now, okay, please. Now, um, <laughs> um, now, um, previously, um, during war time. The time when we were still in a, in alliance with uh, the Soviet Union or and China, for a sense, what we what we had at the time, yeah, I keep I keep I, sorry, I keep saying we Vietnam had at the time pursued a pure form, and I say a pure form of Leninist socialism. See, and at the time, and Leninist socialism, one of the key tenets of, of, of Leninist socialism is there's no private sector, no private sector and no market economy. So the past couple of decades, many Vietnam watchers have examined, have examined Vietnam's social economic trends. And of course, all of them concluded that either I would say now, just for the sake of discussion, I would say Vietnam has reinvented social uh, is is found uh, is socialism in a sense that it is more compatible with a free market economy system. We call it um, something like a market economy with a socialist tendency or something like that, right? In fact, it is still something that is completely different from Leninist socialism. So it is, whatever it is, it is not the pure form of socialism as understood during the wartime. Now it is custom made. That's my, that's my, my interpretation of the, the, the thing custom made or customized socialism. Um, uh, thank you, um, Dr. Vu. Uh, I would like to uh, follow with another question from uh, uh, Mr. Trần Anh Tuấn, 
Tôi chuyên viên S trường Đại học Kinh tế Luật. Uh, he has a, uh, the Vietnamese one. Uh, những cơ hội nào cho Việt Nam nếu áp dụng digital public diplomacy? I think it's relevant to uh, ICT that uh, you yeah. already mentioned. Uh, and his, his question is, những cơ hội nào cho Việt Nam nếu Việt Nam áp dụng digital uh, public diplomacy? Uh. Sorry, yeah, I'm just gonna sit down a little bit. Um, we, are, when it comes to digital digital diplomacy, there's gonna be like as as many opportunity as there are challenges. Opportunities are vast, and now we're talking about one simple thing: how information, how communication, how interaction are transformed via social media, via the internet, at a lightning fast rate, right? So everything can, everything, everyone can be rich instantly by applying, which is why digital diplomacy is a very quick way and also a very effective way to reach out to as many people as possible because virtually everyone like not everyone does like 90 percent seven in vietnam is about 80 percent of people are internet users and elsewhere it the almost all sort of partners international partners that we are targeting their internet penetration rates are as high as vietnam if not even higher so reaching out influencing building image or serving any other purposes via the internet, via social media, would be very fast, effective, and in a sense, cheap. Because instead of sending a delegation abroad, for example, now you have the internet at hand, you have a computer, and you can, this is what a lot of ambassadors, Vietnam, Vietnam Vietnamese ambassadors, and and, 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 and political leaders are doing as well. They have a Facebook channel. Even the government, the Vietnam, Vietnamese government, they, they have a Facebook channel with about 4 million followers there. A message on that can reach about 40, 4 million users in less than one second. So the speed, there are the scope, the widespreading of, of information, of of interactions are the best thing about digital diplomacy. But I have also have to warn, the downside of digital diplomacy is like, like that there's everyone on the internet has some sort of agency. What it means by agency in political terms is that they can act on their own. So or they can actually, a group of people on the internet with the with their use of, of the internet and social media can interfere with a political action by a government sometimes sab sabotage you know any sort of political will or efforts by a government just by a group of people strong enough good enough to spread their own messaging, their own interactions, their own outreach. So the downside would be when it when it comes to doing in digital diplomacy, state and non-state actors both have a very strong tool and dangerous tool as well. And there's something about management of information or disinformation or misinformation right there. But it will be for another discussion though. The, the widespread of disinformation and misinformation is something everybody knows and sees. But it is going to be like a big, another big problem when it comes to, to political communication generally. Thank you. Uh, I, I think another question from Bích Trần, uh, that is related to public diplomacy. Uh, I think that one part of the question has been answered by you already because uh, she asked, how does bamboo diplomacy yeah, yeah. fit into your framework of public diplomacy? But uh, the follow-up question is, uh, is about evaluation. 
Uh, do you think that it has been successful? Uh, because I, I, I read your book, but I, I see that you, you don't talk about the outcome, the outcome or the assessments of the public diplomacy uh, too much. And, and now you can try uh, giving some, some personal evaluation on, on, the, on Vietnam's public diplomacy. Uh, right. Um, that's a very interesting question. The evaluation of public diplomacy, a PD, has always been very hard. And part of the problem is something that I presented in the book as well. Part of the problem is like it's hard to actually pinpoint a certain action of public diplomacy to a certain outcome because an outcome might be just caused by a lot of different actions that have nothing to do with public diplomacy at all. Like, for example, and this is like a very, very crude example about, about, for example, we spend a lot of, I, I'm just going back to the thing that Vietnam, I think Vietnam do the best when it comes to cultural diplomacy. Other than that, there's still some questionable uh, performance there. But when it comes to now, we, we do a lot of cultural diplomacy activities and something that, 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 that seemed like we're doing really well is to is to actually um, have a lot of cultural uh, exchange activities uh, um, hosted by a lot of embassies around the world. Also, a lot of broadcasting when it comes to introducing Vietnam to the world, including a lot of, of video clips on, say, Vietnam Airlines. People, you know, passengers getting in and they see the first thing on the screen would be some traditional dancing that shows, you know, the beautiful size of, of the Vietnamese culture, something like that. I think Vietnam has done well when it comes to it. In my book, and right now, one of the things that I'm trying to do is actually trying to map those actions with, with some sort of online reactions. See, for example, um, an, an event, a Vietnam, uh, a Vietnam, for example, broadcast a, a, a video clip on BBC. On This is just an example. This is not real, though. On BBC, on the 2nd of December, 2022. After that, what I'm trying, what I'm, well, what we try, what I will try to do is to see how that event is mentioned on social media and on the internet, including users or queries, or basically like Google, Google search or Bing searches. Is there any kind of is any kind of spike in terms of user queries or discussions or mentions of that event? Now. The tricky part is to map those two things together. If there are some sort of direct kind of data flow between the two data points like that, usually we can say, for example, now this event has caused an upsurge in terms of public interest in Vietnam because, you know, because we can see that there's a direct link between the event on you know, the the ad on BBC and public foreign public interest in Vietnam right after it was broadcasted, but the thing is, how do we know that? Because some of the data would not be just because they see the the clip on BBC, but because they already wanted to to go to see Vietnam anyway. Some people are actually sit in here searching for a trip to Vietnam, not because they watched BBC, but because they have always loved visiting Vietnam. Those kind of outlier data would be very hard to actually contribute or uh, attribute to, to the BBC clip, for example, which is why the evaluation work has always been really hard because it just, the in the nature, of this kind of work, of this kind of political communication that you don't actually see. Rarely you see kind of a, a direct impact like that. Usually everything is long-term and when it comes to long-term, there's various 
external factors in that. But I can say for, for Vietnamese public, for Vietnamese culture diplomacy, by tracking long-term data about tourism and about mentions on the internet, about mentions on social media, I can say with certainty with some sort of confidence that Vietnamese pub cultural diplomacy has an impact on international, has a clear impact, a direct impact on international arrivals the past 10 years. How much of that is actually like to say how much like 20%, 30%, that's hard to tell. That's really hard to tell. I hope that has answered the question. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Wu. Um, uh, another question is from uh, Dr. Jing Wing Kang, uh, USSH, uh, Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh. And his question is, what could be Vietnam's soft power through public diplomacy? Or, uh, how can you see subpower from the, the lens of PD, uh, please? This is, I have to say, I have to say that this is like something that I, 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 I have a strong opinion about, but also I avoid discussing that because, you know, it has become some sort of, um, of common knowledge that when it comes to Public diplomacy, they always think about soft power. Like, pop, like a lot of people say, public diplomacy is the best instrument to promote a country's soft power. That is like, that is like a, like a buzzword, a, a buzz phrase, I would say. The, the problem with that kind of, of, of saying, that I think is very, no, with no offense, I think it is, conflated in a sense that we don't have an agreement on what is on what public diplomacy is and we certainly don't have an agreement on what soft power is how can we how can we match those terms up in a sentence like that it is methodologically challenging and i would say in terms of ontology as well because we actually we we actually in you know in terms in terms of research in terms of theories we are actually doing we 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 are merging we are massing two unclear concepts into one and mm. thinking that that's going to be having any sort of validity and that's what i think and why I think so, because even the, the father, you know, the father of the concept soft power, uh, Joseph Nye, he actually upgraded, uh, explained, tried to do a lot of versions of his concept, conceptualization of soft power over the year. Sometimes it is like this, it is not clear enough. No, let's do another version. Public diplomacy is the same. People keep debating the past at least 20 years about what is and what is not public diplomacy. To the point right now, it's just like in Australia, for example, public diplomacy is for foreign publics. In Indonesia, public diplomacy mostly is for inter-tribal communities because Indonesia is just like a very big, you know, um, you know, you know, uh, like a big, you know, sorry, and just like a country that has one of the most diverse, uh, you know, uh, ethnic groups in the world. So they use public diplomacy to actually build a bridge between their people first. And in the U.S., for example, the U.S. considered public diplomacy to be the same, or at least the other side of public affairs, which is why they have a brand called Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs under the department, under the State Department. So the two concepts actually, the, to them, are one and the same. So, which is to say, having said that, 
sorry, I haven't said that. By looking at, you know, uh, the real practice by a lot, especially inter, uh, in uh, by regional countries like Vietnam and 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 and, and Thailand and Singapore, for example, every single country thinks that the best thing to promote uh, their soft power, whatever that is, is using cultural channels. So they think channel, all of them think culture is the, the most valuable access, uh, asset when it comes to to, to, to soft power, which is why there's a new term in the region, which is called cultural soft power. Just to say that, and the reason they are emphasizing soft power, uh, culture-based soft power is very simple. Our, our political values, regional political values, don't actually match with Western world with Western democracies, either Singapore, either Vietnam, or Thailand, or Cambodia. All of the countries like that use some sort of cultural diplomacy to promote what they call soft power, but they would never promote their political beliefs or political values. So to say, in theory, I would not try to draw soft power and public democracy together, but by looking at the practice, I would say a lot of people, a lot of countries, consider culture to be the key asset when it comes to soft power, and promoting culture using public diplomacy, or cultural diplomacy, or all sort of things that involve certain type of culture, is the best way to promote. Um, soft power. I hope that has answered uh, the question somehow. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wu, for y your answer on the conflations of uh, uh, soft power and, and pity as well as uh, cultural diplomacy. Uh, I think uh, there are still some uh, broad questions uh, that uh, cover a lot of a lot of things about diplomacy. And I don't think that they are restricted only to public diplomacy. I don't know whether you like it, uh, uh, you like these questions or not, or, or, but uh, please try to answer these questions. Uh, the first question that I want to, uh, to say is from uh, Thị Ngọc Mỹ Nguyên, uh, University of Sigan. Uh, she is the research assistant there. Her question is, what are diplomatic strategies that Vietnam is implementing to the US, EU, Russia, and China amid the energy crisis and economic inflation to ensure stable social economic situation in Vietnam? So it's, uh, it's a very broad one. Uh, <laughs> what are Vietnam's diplomatic strategies uh, to stabilize the economy and society? Uh, 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 this is a very, um, this is a very broad question, and this is not exactly um, uh, my my uh, my specialty as um, you know uh, either. But the point, you know, uh, as a as a as a researcher uh, of uh, diplomacy, I would say that uh, generally, uh, the term the term bamboo diplomacy captures the whole concept of Vietnam's foreign policy, in a sense, when it comes to how Vietnam is conducting itself uh, in all sort of, in you know, very tricky and challenging relations. You, um, the question actually grouped all sort of different countries with different kind of intents and interests together. But the way Vietnam is handling Things like um, you know those tricky relations, like including uh, navigating uh, the U.S.-China rivalry, or uh, navigating the, the the energy crisis right now. I learned uh, you know from you know 
personally, it is not something that I, I actually uh, uh, learned in deep. But I learned that Vietnam has been in some sort of uh, a, a, a surfer uh, exchange and diplomacy, surfer di diplomacy with the, 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 e the EU and you know the EU delegation and a delegation in Hanoi and with uh, the uh, with the State Department in the US to secure some sort of uh, of energy uh, supplies, which is to say that uh, there's no other choice. In a sense, I believe there's no other choice for 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 a nation state like Vietnam to conduct international affairs rather than trying to be as flexible as possible and as and just like that the 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 the, the art or the um sorry um uh the the the, the tenet of of um multilateralism of global integration of not choosing sides of no ally, no alliance those tenets serve vietnam right and uh, that is something that has been a lesson from the past choosing sides in a great rivalry you know a great power rivalry means subjecting yourself to either the winning side or the losing side but if you lose you lose big and there's no way to tell whether there's going to be a winning side. So better be flexible, better be a bamboo, better suffer around all sort of partners to get all sort of things you need without leaning on anything. I think, I mean, leaning on any side. That's just, to, to me, I think that's the right way to do. Uh, thank you, Wu. Um... Another question is from uh, Tong. Uh, his question is, uh, to be exact, what does being a diplomat, a diplomat mean? Any role model can be recorded, of course, in, Viet in Vietnamese context, and that role model is Vietnamese. Uh, what is your concept about being a diplomat? And do you have any, any role model in your mind right now that you think that uh, you can recommend to uh, to the audience right here? This this is not a, a question that I can answer. No, sorry, I can't answer this question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Vu. And another question from uh, Lu Nguyen Vu, uh, a student uh, of FUV. Um, uh, his question is, how is Vietnam's political system perceived by foreigners? Um, and do you have any uh, uh, assessment on that and any information on that? And does it impede economic growth? Um, if, yeah. Maybe, yeah. The first part, yes. The second part, uh, hard to tell. Now, um, I'm talking from the point of political communication. And see, uh, I actually wrote that in my book as well after a talk a really nice talk with uh, Madame Tung Nguyen Thinh. So I, I talked to her over a coffee mm -hmm. and this is what she told me. We should stop along this line. We should, should stop telling the world that we are socialist. Nobody likes that. Mm -hmm. That's what she told me. And I, I agreed. No matter how domestic politics is going on, no matter how domestic structure, political structure is going on with all sort of machineries and stuff like that. We, if you want to get close to the world, and by the world, I mean biggest partners that we have right now, most of them are democracies. Then you better not tell them something they don't like to hear. Keep it to yourself. Which is what, which is to say that in terms of political communication, if we now our political you know, Vietnam's political system is not something that should be promoted a lot. Sometimes I am just amazed to see that certain kind of very socialist, uh, but domestic should be internal messages 
got broadcasted to the world. And there's some backflash when it comes to that as well, because that is not something that we want to tell people. Mind your own business or something like that. The second part about whether whether uh, the political system, how the, the, the unique political system in Vietnam impede any kind of economic growth, not, not over the top of my, my, my head. Uh, usually to answer this kind of questions, I'm gonna do some data analysis, but I have a feeling, and this is just a feeling, that Vietnam occupies a unique position a unique geopolitical position, way bigger than the internal strength of Vietnam itself, which is why Vietnam, in a sense, has, you know, uh, I, to put it lightly, big countries, great powers, they tolerate a lot of different things in Vietnam, they usually don't with other countries given the position, given the unique position of Vietnam in the world. So there has been a, some sort of issues when it come, issue, issues when it comes to how Vietnam, you know, you know, um, uh, handle the issue, uh, handle human rights, for example, or say, um, uh, some sort of, um, um, missteps here and there when it comes to international relations. And with all sort of threats of sanctions or, or embargoes and stuff like that, other countries usually got to face. Vietnam got a really, a sly slap on the wrist. That's all I can say. And there is something to be, to think about. Mostly when it comes to, to economic growth in this world, in, in our modern world now, are uh, if you are important enough as a partner, as a market, you get a lot of leeway. Because by the end of the day, it is just money. It is just economy. That's what I think. That's what I think. And that's what I observe. And that's, it's not just Vietnam because, uh, I work in, in, in Australia and I work with the government. So it's just something that I that I observe. Like if you have kind of a a present when it comes to a market, when it comes to uh, you and your customer base, usually you get treated better. That's all I can tell. Thank you. Uh thank you, uh, Vo. Uh it's um uh... Like eight uh, twenty six p.m. right now, uh, local time, and I think that uh, we still have the last question to wrap up uh, the talk today. Uh, it is from Jing Nguyen, a student of Phong Bra University, Vietnam. I will rephrase the questions a little bit. Um, in your opinion, what's the most effective public diplomacy policy that Vietnam has ever taken, and and what what lessons that Vietnam can can draw from that, or we can draw from that. Uh, uh, you have around like three minutes uh, to answer these two questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it is not about, I think there's some sort of a typo there. Maybe uh, maybe the, the asker was just about public uh, diplomacy, not public policy, right? Yeah, so I think that, yeah. Yeah, they, they are excited. Yeah, and I actually, I had answered this kind of uh, question before, I think, of all the measures that we use for public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy is the brightest. Mm -hmm. And the reason was something like that, something about culture is like more accessible, less offensive than anything else. And Vietnamese culture, wow, there's nothing, that, there's no need to, to say anything more. It's very appealing to foreign publics in Australia. Actually, Australia, Australia, Australian people love to travel to see Vietnam. Vietnam has consistently been one of the top 10 destinations for Australian people. That says something. 
uh, thank you very much, Vu. Uh, we still have around like two minutes. Uh, maybe I would like to take advantage of your two minutes uh, before we leave. Uh, because uh, uh, in, your part, uh, in your part of ICT, and you are talking a lot about uh, internet pen uh, penetration in Vietnam, about mobile connections, you talk a lot about uh, how internet has spread to uh, on parts of Vietnam. Um, but what, what about uh, uh, how ICT has connected Vietnam to the world, to the outside world? I mean, the target audience is not the Vietnamese population, uh, uh, but the, the outside world, because one of the big the biggest problems of Vietnam right now is the language, because I don't think that uh, Vietnam has a lot of uh, uh, endless language, uh, newspapers, media that can uh, send their messages uh, to to the target audience uh, overseas. And what do you think about this one? Uh, you can answer quickly. Okay. Yeah, the language barrier is there, but compared, you know, but when you look at, you know, uh, uh, look, you know, like a look back to the past, about if I'm not mistaken, about 15 years ago, there was no Google Translate or Bing Translate. So see, the language barrier is still there, but it's getting much better now. I think by by an estimate, Bing Translate, Google Translate, those kind of machine translate engines can handle about 80% of normal conversations. And 80% of normal conversations could always be a big number, see, compared to nothing. And so actually, I know Vietnamese people use Google Translate a lot, must be one of the top 10. So it is there, the, the, the language barrier, but it's getting better. Something to, to actually be happy about, I think. Yeah, uh, uh, that's the end of the day. Uh, but I think that uh, it's nearly 1 a.m. Uh, early morning the next day uh, in Australia. And I cannot uh, express my thanks uh, to, uh, to you for stay up so late and tomorrow you have to now uh then you have to uh to, to go to bed and then work um thank you very much uh, uh dr Vulam, for a very insightful and interesting talk we love to have you again uh in in next talks and and to cooperate with us in the in the future i would like to say thanks to um to yao dang uh, who has been here until the end and also uh, the audience who have been uh, very patient uh, to stay and to contribute very interesting questions uh, to the presenter. Uh, once again, thank you, uh, everyone, and have a good night. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Nice to meet you, Angel. Uh, Bye. Uh, <laughs>